Church, my name is Beth and I serve as the high school pastor and I'm so glad that you decided to tune in today. If it's your first time with us, we want you to know that we are so glad you're here. And at Buckhead Church, our mission is to inspire people to follow Jesus. And if you wanna learn more about Buckhead or find a way to make this place feel more like your church, we would love to connect with you and know that you're here. So just head to buckheadchurch.org slash new. Now we have been counting down the days to be back with you and your families. And we honestly can't wait until June 6th where all of our environments are together. We will be requiring registration for our attendees. And so early next week, you can expect to receive an email with registration and our updated safety protocols to welcome you back safely. The best way for you to register is to stay up to date on our email list. So if you're not currently receiving our emails, you can go to buckheadchurch.org slash emails to get on the list. And a huge part of gearing up for June 6 is our amazing volunteers. So if you are currently volunteering, thank you. And if you're not currently volunteering and have been interested and are unsure of where to start, we have the perfect opportunity for you. This summer, we are offering a volunteer trial period for you to get the chance to test the waters of volunteering and help Buckhead Church begin to open our doors again to our community. You can find all the details at buckheadchurch.org slash volunteer. And now to all of you families of high school students, we have an amazing opportunity coming up for your high school student this summer called Inside Out Daytona. Inside Out Daytona is our week long summer camp happening July 19th through the 23rd. And this week is an amazing opportunity for your student to connect with their friends, to connect with their small group leader and to connect with their heavenly father. And this is one of those camps that oftentimes when students are graduating and reflecting back on their high school experience, they talk about this camp in the way that it was life-changing and a pivotal moment for them in their four years of high school. So you can learn more information and register your student by going to insideoutstudents.org. Up next, we are going to hear from Andy with his message titled Rules for the Road. And after, we will have a time of worship from wherever you are. So again, we are so glad that you have decided to join us today. Here's the thing, um, vacation season is upon us and I hope hopefully you'll get a break sometime this summer to go do something fun. But um, even if you don't, I, I hope that you this, there's a, a sense of vacation for you this summer as most of us take advantage of the summer. Um, actually, my family, my entire family, Sandra's parents, brother and sister, extended family, 17 of us, um, they all left yesterday to go to the beach, to go to Hilton Head without me which tell, should tell you how important you are to me that I stayed behind. <laughs> but then I got to thinking, or how unimportant I am that they went ahead to vacation and um, um, left me here. So what we're gonna do in the spirit of summer vacation, in the spirit of summer vacation, today's message is entitled, as I mentioned, Rules for the Road, Rules for the Road, five tips, five tips um, to ensure that you reach your destination safely. But of course, my, um, my real intent in this message is to take these road rules or rules for the road and apply them to our daily lives. Because Tom Cochran, who actually wrote that song, is exactly right. He, he, the, the beginning of the, uh, the song says this, life is, life is like a road you're on. Life is like a road that you travel on when there's one day here and the next day gone. You only get to live each day one time. But the um, road of life or the, the, uh, the adventure of life is actually more complicated than a highway because we are all born, are we come equipped with rear view mirrors 
What we don't come equipped with is a reverse, right? There, there are no do-overs. You only get to do your 20s once. And you look in the rear view mirror and you see how you did your 20s and you're like, I would like to go back and do some of that. And then you look and it's just, you know, park and it's drive. And, and park is only momentary, right? But we just, we just can't go back. You can't go back and redo your 30s or that first marriage or raise your kids again or raise that first child again because you know the third one came along and you thought, I think I kind of overloaded the, the first one. So we, we all have regrets because we all have a rear view mirror, but there are no verses. And some of us, if we're honest, it's you know, temperament, personality, we spend a way too much time looking in the rear view mirror of our lives and, you know, obsessing on our regrets. But the truth is the future from this moment forward is like a road we're on. And it's what we do from this point forward that makes all the difference. And of course we can learn from our mistakes, but you can't live your life looking in the rear view mirror, just like you shouldn't drive looking in the rear view mirror. And especially with life, because again, there's just no way to go back. And this is what we all have in common, whether you're a person of faith or not a person of faith, we all wanna get the future right. We just all wanna get it right. And we all wanna arrive safely in some destination. And um, you may be a goal, uh, you know, somebody who sets a lot of goals, I'm not really uh, set a lot of goals. I have some sort of high level goals that I keep in a little bulletin board in my closet that deal with my family and just a couple of high level things. Some of you are very detailed um, goal setters but everybody, everybody listening, everybody in the rooms, if you could stand up and say, okay, at a high level, here's what I want my future to look like. Here's what I want my future to look like relationally, financially with my kids, or hopefully I wanna have kids one day or wanna get remarried, whatever it might be. So we all kind of have a, a general idea of where we wanna end up in this season of life and where we wanna end up in life in general. And hopefully these five rules will help you get there. So five rules for the road. I'm gonna do these pretty quick, all super practical. Um, just a heads up, if you came today looking for deep, deep, deep Bible study, we just did that for nine weeks, okay? So this is just a summation of just some practical things to help us move forward with life. So rule number one, rule number one, don't travel alone, don't travel alone. We say this all the time around here that life is better connected because you were made for community. That life is better connected because you were made for community. So you travel with friends. You just don't allow yourself to get isolated. And in certain seasons of life, because of the pain and the things that we've gone through, and again, personality, there's always the temptation to be a little bit isolated. So I wanna encourage you to ignore that voice in your head. Ignore that voice in your head that says, I don't need anybody because you were created to live in and to operate in community. You do need some bodies around you. We were created for that. But who we do life with oftentimes determines how our lives go, right? And one of the tricks, then one of the, the things that, again, I'm gonna put some language around something we've all um, um, experienced from time to time. The trick in life when it comes to who we do life with is don't simply gravitate toward acceptance. Don't simply gravitate toward acceptance. Um, acceptance is a powerful, powerful draw, right? But don't simply gravitate toward acceptance because that can be a trap. Acceptance is magnetic. And where this is most important is in the transitions of life. You're leaving high school to go to college. You're leaving college to go to grad school. You're leaving grad school to start your first job. You're leaving the city to go to another city. You've just gotten out of a relationship and you're looking for a new relationship. You've just gone through a divorce. You kind of hit pause for a couple of years and now you're open to start dating again. In every single transition in life, in every single transition in life, especially relationally, we are prone to gravitate toward acceptance. That is the person or the people that accept us first oftentimes without giving much thought to it, become the people that we spend a season of life with. And again, if, you, if you've raised teenagers, you know how powerful this is. And, this, and if, again, if, if you change schools or you went to a new job and you walk in that first day and you don't know anyone or you come to a new city, you don't know anyone, or you come to a new church and you don't know anyone, isn't it true that the first group of people who reach out to you and, and extend some sort of invitation to do something, invitation to travel, invitation to participate in something. It feels so good because you don't know anyone else. And before you know it, you are doing life with people who may not be anything like you, who you normally wouldn't even necessarily like, 
but because they accepted you, I mean, we are all acceptance magnets and we all just flow toward acceptance. So when it comes to who you do life with, don't simply give in to the magnetic draw of the person or the first group of people who show up and extend an invitation, even though they're probably maybe great people and you know as sincere as they could possibly be. Because the people who get on the inside of our lives often determine the direction and the quality of our lives. And don't simply be content, this is so important. Don't simply be content to do life with people who share your tastes. And oftentimes the connecting point is taste. We like the same music, we like the same restaurants, we're in the same generation, we're in the same you know, part of the country where we share certain tastes. Look for people, this is so important, especially in the transitions, look for people who share your values. You know what a value is? A value is what you have predetermined is most important to you. There are things that are most important to you. And when you find people, and sometimes you kinda gotta move through some groups of people, good people, wonderful people, just not the right people. When you can find people that you share your values with, that they have the same values that you have, even though they may, may not eat at the same restaurants or go to the same concerts, when you are able to do life, begin to do life with people who share your values, they will have your back, you will have their back and there is a synergy of values that will ensure that at the end of this season of life, that you will still be prioritized around the things that you have decided are most important in life and most important for you. And you'll get the most out of life. You'll get what you want most out of life. And again, you know this, who we do life with, who we travel with, often determines the direction and the quality of our lives. In fact, uh, if you have um, children in any of our um, ministry environments, one of the principles that we come back to in ch with children, middle school and high school over and over and over is this statement. Your friends determine the direction and the quality of your life. Your friends determine the direction and the quality of our lives. Or to put it within this context, our friends determine the direction and the quality of the trip. So who we surround ourselves with, who we do life with is so extraordinarily, extraordinarily important. And this is not to say, and if you've been a part of what we do for a long time, you won't misunderstand me. But if you're new, I wanna make sure you don't. We're not saying that anyone is unimportant. We're not saying that anyone is less important. What I'm saying is this, when it comes to that inner circle, who you're traveling through life with, surround yourself with people that embrace your Values. The, the author of Proverbs said it this way. And again, this is one of the anchor verses for children in middle school and high school students in all of our ministries. The author of, Hebrew, of, of Proverbs wrote this. Whoever walks, does life with, the wise automatically over time becomes wise. That is, and, and wisdom, we talk about this all the time. Wisdom is understanding and living as if life is connected. That what happens today impacts tomorrow. That what happened yesterday is gonna show up in my life today, that life is connected. And so the author of, uh, of Proverbs says this, when we do life with, when we walk in life with, when we do life with people who are wise, who understand that life is connected, that I've gotta be disciplined in this season because of what I want in the next season, you become wise. But then there's a contrast because the liter Proverbs literature always has these, these, um, these contrasts, sometimes two, sometimes three. But the companion of a fool, and this is so interesting, the companion of a fool, and a fool in um, you know, Proverbs literature or literature that's you know, primarily Proverbs, there's a specific definition, definition for a fool. A fool is someone who lives life without care or who is careless. That's like, this is what I'm gonna do today. Yeah, but. How's that gonna impact you tomorrow? Well, that's tomorrow. This is today. Life is disconnected. The companion of fools, and the, it's interesting, he doesn't say the companion of fools will become a fool. I mean, walk with the wise, you'll become wise. The companion of fools doesn't necessarily become a fool. This is why giving in to the gravitational pull of a group of people can be so dangerous if we're not careful. The companion of fools may never become a fool, but the companion of fools will suffer the same consequence as a fool because that's who they're traveling with. That's who you're traveling with. So bottom line is kind of this, travel with people who are taking care of themselves, because if they're taking care of themselves, they will help you take care of yourself and you will help them take care of themselves as well. So don't travel alone. Now, rule number two is kind of an offshoot of rule number one. Rule number two is simply this, don't pick up strangers. Don't pick up strangers. Now, I need to define stranger, okay? A stranger is someone who is strange. 
That's who a stranger is. Or now, honestly, we're all a little bit of strange, little bit strange to somebody, right? So someone who, let's just say, someone who is stranger than you, okay? That's what I mean by a stranger. Um, when my, my mom, who passed away a few years ago, was very, very outgoing. My dad, not so much outgoing. And my mom, wherever she went, she would just meet people and she was very friendly. She would begin conversations with people in line. She would begin conversations with, with strangers all the time. And this would kind of get on my dad's nerves. <laughs> and he would say to her, this was kind of one of their things. You know, how your parents had like a thing. This is one of their things. He would say, Annie, her name was Anna Margaret. He called her Annie, he said, Annie, don't talk to strangers. I can remember my, hearing my dad says, Annie, don't talk to strangers. And my mom would say, well, after I meet them, they're not strangers anymore. <laughs> so my mom is literally a person who never met a what? She never met a stranger because she was so outgoing and which was a great trait. So what I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't meet people and don't be friendly, okay? And the reason I tell you that story is this part of the story. When I was in college, she flew to North Carolina to spend some time with her mom and when she came back, I'll never forget, we're kind of gathering around in the kitchen and she said, she put her hands on her hips. She said, well, I finally met a stranger. <clears throat> and what had happened was she was flying back and she was sitting next to a guy and he had had a little bit too much to drink and I'll just leave it there. She finally met a stranger, but it was so funny to hear her say that because it wasn't like she didn't have guardrails. It wasn't like she wasn't dialed in to, there's just some people in the world that she just need to be careful around. She was super friendly. But she understood there's, there, at some point there's a, you know what? I can't travel with you. So bottom line on this one is simply this. Be kind, that's a fruit of the spirit. Be kind, but be careful. Careful of who you allow in your vehicle. Careful about who you allow in the inner circle of your life. We are kind to everyone. We are patient with everyone. We're compassionate and generous with everyone but be careful who you allow in the inner circle because it goes back to, to rule number one. He who walks with the wise goes wise, the companion of fools. You may never be a fool, but if you're too close to the people who aren't living life according to your values, when something happens to them, it may happen to you as well. So I wanna just kind of ask this question as we move on. Do you have any strangers in your life? And, and do you have any strangers you've allowed into the inner circle. And let me tease that out a little bit. Is there anyone you're doing life with, if you're real honest, that they make you less healthy? Um, they, they cause you to doubt yourself. They, they seem to always be slowly and maybe subtly chipping away, chipping away at your values. They're kind of dismissive of your values. And at times you're almost intimidated to be yourself because of how they're gonna respond. In fact, over time, you have found yourself becoming a different person when you're around that person. That is a stranger and you need to drop them off. God loves them, you can't handle them. God loves them because, and I used to teach this principle to high school students and college students all the time. They'd be like, yeah, but God loves everybody and blah, blah, blah. I go, wait, okay, wait, hold on, come here, come here. Look, God loves them. You can't handle them. Maybe someday you will be able to handle a person like that. But if you, if your life is being bent and moved and drawn in a direction that creates you know, tension on the inside, dings your conscience, you find yourself doing things you never intended to do, you find yourself drifting from your values, you find yourself being dishonest with another group of people because again, suddenly you find yourself, there's just too much duplicity, you're kind of living two different lives. That's a stranger and you need to drop them off. And there's nothing more difficult perhaps than ending what seems to be a friendship or a relationship. But for the sake of that other person, who needs someone else in their life to perhaps bring them back to a sense of balance in terms of life in general or perhaps faith. For their sake, for your sake, you might need to drop them off or go back to the car thing for a second. You would not repeatedly loan your car to someone who repeatedly trashed it. So don't loan yourself to someone who repeatedly trashes you, okay? So that's rule number two. It got so quiet on 
like that one. It's so intense. Okay, rule number three. You said, Andy, this, you thought this was supposed to be fun. It, it, it's kind of fun. Okay, now, rule number three is this. I want you to choose, a, when you're traveling, right, you choose a destination. You don't just travel, right? You choose a destination and borrow a map. This is kind of a two-part thing. Choose a destination and borrow a map. Here's what I mean by choose a destination. Um, everybody ends up somewhere in life. I mean, you don't, what, goals, no goals, you know, destination in mind, no destination. Time just goes by. And if you've got the health to endure your 30s and your 40s and your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, your 90s, maybe you become a centenarian, you live to be 100 years old. You're, you, everybody ends up somewhere in life. The when, the when, just humanly speaking, and the when in terms of being a Jesus follower, the when is to end up somewhere on purpose, right? And just as in a long road trip, there are multiple legs, you know, the first day we went here, second day we went there, third day here, stayed two days there, fourth day. It's just as there are multiple legs on a road trip, there are multiple seasons in life, right? Multiple seasons in life. And it is so important in each season of life to determine your destination in that season. Now, you've all already done this. We've all already done this. I mean, you've got an elementary school, your parents said your destination is to get out of the fifth grade and to get into middle school. So they, it's like, okay, you got a fifth grade middle school. Then you got into middle school and your parents said, and you decided, you know, what, I'm gonna get out of middle school. My destination is gonna be to show up for the correct fall in ninth grade. So this whole idea of setting a destination for each season, we, we grow up with with some, you know, sort of a paradigm or a template that teaches us that. But once we get out into the work world and the job world, it's easy to lose sight of the fact there are still seasons of life. There's single season and there's married season and maybe first marriage and there's a gap and the second marriage and there's kids and there's grandkids. I mean, there's all these seasons. In each season of life, you need to choose some vague or general or maybe specific sense of a destination. It's important to choose that in each life. Um, determine essentially, determine what you want your life to look like in each, se in, in each season or in this season. Here's why, again, this is so important. Obviously, you don't wanna drift, nobody wants to drift. And if we don't decide, here's the thing, if we don't choose what we want this season to look like or what we want to look like at the end of the season, if we don't choose circumstances and people and life in general, just, they just decide for us because the days keep clicking by, the days keep clicking. Life is a highway, another day, another day, another day, rear view mirror, uh-oh, no reverse, another day, another day, another day. So why wouldn't we just Decide, because again, life is connected. This season leads to the next. If I don't set the correct destination for this season, I won't be prepared for the next one. This is what wisdom dictates, that I am thinking about this season, not simply in light of what's right ahead of me, but right in front of me, but ultimately what's ahead of me, because one season leads to the other. Each season builds on the other, right? And you, you know this, wishing, wishing won't get you there. Someday I wanna meet someone. Someday I'd like to be happily married. Someday I'd like to have kids. Some, wishing won't get you there, right? Um, someday I wanna be successful financially. Someday I wanna forget, go to graduate school. Someday, someday, someday. That's just a, that's a wish, that's not a plan. It, it goes back to um, what I call the principle of the path. We, we've talked about this in the, path that, in the past that direction, direction, not intention, determines our destination. This is true when you're driving. This is true when you're living. It's the direction, not the intention that determines your destination, okay? You can drive north with the intention of going to Key West. You will never get to Key West. I don't care what your intentions are, right? You can intend and you can, you can pray and you can trust God and you will end up in Canada, okay? It just, it just doesn't, it, it, the intention is almost irrelevant. Intention should lead us quickly to some sense of direction. So in every season of life, in every season of life, we need to choose what the destination is, not for our entire lives, but for this season, because the seasons are connected. And if we're not prepared for the next season in this, se in this season, then when we get to the next season, well, duh, we're just not prepared. Again, it goes, I, I mentioned this a minute ago. You only get to do your 20s one time. You only get to do your 30s one time. You only get to do your 40s one time. You only get to do a first marriage one time. You only get to do the, you know, the raising, you know, that son of yours just one time. And again, you'd be better prepared for the second or the third child, but that, that first one, I mean, that daughter. You, we only get to do this one time. Again, two rear view mirrors, no reverse. My, my dad, um, 
has had a sort of a version of this same statement that he had in his office. I don't know if he made it up or he found it somewhere, but I, you know, as a kid, you remember things in your house. And this is one of the things I remember, a little plaque that said this, discipline, discipline, not desire, determines our destiny. And do you know what discipline is? Discipline is in this season, in this season, I wanna make sure I'm disciplined enough in this season to prepare myself for the next season because life is a highway and there's another destination and there's another destination coming down the road. So decide now, decide now so that when you get to the end of this season, you'll look back on what you need to look back on to ensure that you're ready for the next season. When Sandra and I um, had little kids, I mean, you know, they're, they're all this little and smaller. At one point we had three in diapers for about a minute and then, Sandra didn't like me to tell that story, but we, um, anyway, our oldest, we, we just decided you're potty trained and we just kind of moved on and you know, <laughs> he eventually was, but you just can't, I mean, three in diapers, it's just, it's just too much. Anyway, um, so in that season, you know, it's so busy, like I need to tell you that it's just, there's just stuff coming and going. And you know, we're getting, you know, there's always more opportunities than time and there's always more friends than time and there's always more hobbies than time. And so we just decided in that season, we, we came up with a list. We called it our no for now, but not forever list. No for now, but not forever list. In other words, here are some categories of things we're just not gonna do. We're not gonna, you know, next Thursday, can you do this? Let me check the calendar. You know, that, that, that just drives you crazy. We just decided there are some categories. I'm not gonna tell you what they were because you gotta come up with your own categories. But sometimes in a season of life, because of what you want to accomplish and because of what's most important in that season, you just have to prioritize and say, you know what? This is not a bad thing. This is just a no thing for now. And then when we get through this season, it's a yes. No for now, but not no forever. Those are the kinds of decisions you make once you've decided what is most critical in this season of my life. When you're in school, you gotta do that. When you're starting a new job, you gotta do that. When you're beginning a new relationship, you gotta do that. When you're beginning a new marriage, you have to do that. When you're raising kids, no for now, but not forever because what? Because of the, desti the destination I've determined for myself in this season of life. Now, the second part of this is borrow a map. And here's what I mean by that. Somebody has already been to where you're hoping to arrive, right? I mean, somebody's already been there. They've been there and they've done that and they've done it poorly or they've done it well, but somebody has traveled this road before. And here's the thing, and this is kind of insulting, but when you, when you transition into a new season of life, you don't know what you're doing. How could you? You've never done it before. I mean, the, the, the ultimate example of that is, you know, <laughs> so we had our first child and, you know, we stayed a couple nights in the hospital and um, the nurse comes in and says those awful things. This is what she said. She said, she smiled when she said it, but it was terrible. She said, Mr. Stanley, if you'll pull the car around to the front entrance of the hospital, I'll bring Mrs. Stanley down and Andrew and you can go home. <laughs> and I thought, by ourselves? <laughs> I don't even know how to change a flat tire. You're sending me home with a baby, right? Could, would you come home? Is there anyone who could come home with us? I mean, do you remember this? It's like, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, in other seasons of life, we just think we know what we're doing, but how could we possibly know that every season of life is different? So the wisest thing you could do is find somebody and borrow their map. Another illustration, right now, our small group, our community group, we've all been married 30 to 33 years, everybody in our community group. And so it's hard to decide what are we gonna study? And you know what the felt need was? The felt need was how do we parent adult children? Now, for some of you, you're thinking, is that even a thing? It's a thing, isn't it? All of you parenting adult children, isn't it a thing? It's like, you're saying, I thought, par I thought parenting ended when they went off to a job or off to college. No, it's just another season of parenting. So we don't know what we're doing. And after our first couple of meetings as a small group on this topic, we realized, we don't know what we're doing. And we found a book. Somebody has written a book on how to parent adult kids, like kids who have left home and are getting married. And, and so that's what we're studying. You know why? Because we don't know what we're doing. But somebody has written a map and somebody has investigated. And this is what I'm talking about. You need to find somebody's map, okay? And it, the other way to do this is you, you know some people who kind of down the road from you and sort of accomplish what you hope to accomplish either professionally or academically or maybe marriage and family. And here's my suggestion. 
you get their email address and you email them and you don't say, will you mentor me? Don't ever ask anyone to mentor you, okay? You send them three questions. You say, you know what? My wife and I, or hey, I've just got into this new job or I've just moved to the city or whatever. And I have three questions. Here's the three questions. Would you meet me for coffee or I'll buy you dinner if you'll just answer these three questions. And essentially what you're saying is, I want your map. They don't say I want your map because they're like, <laughs> what? Okay, so they'll think you're just a stranger. And then we already covered that, okay? <laughs> they'll think you're strange. So, so this is your way of saying, tell me what you know. And, and here's the thing about people who are a season ahead of you in life and I'm a season ahead of some of you. We don't know how much we know until someone asks. We have um, small groups with married, young married couples or newlywed couples, and it is so fun as somebody who's been married a long time to drop into one of those groups. Because you, you, know, you show up, and Sandra and I spent a whole year one time, instead of doing our own small group, we just went from group to group to group with the young married couples. And the first couple of times, well, the first time, we were like so scared, like, oh, what are they gonna ask? And when we got in the car afterwards, we thought, we know a lot. We just know a lot. You just don't know what you know until somebody who doesn't know begins to ask you questions, okay? So one of the best things you can do is you can reach ahead a generation and say, hey, show me your map. Show me your map. You, you might be familiar with what's called the Vernon Law. You may have heard this before, even though you didn't know it was called this. Um, here's what the Vernon Law is. That experience <clears throat> is a hard teacher because it gives the test first and the lesson afterwards. Experience is a hard teacher because, oh no, I failed the test and now I realize what I should have known. The only way to avoid this is to get ahead and invite information, authors or people into your life in this season so when the test comes, you will already have had the lesson. And acknowledging, come on, you know this, acknowledging what you don't know and inviting somebody into that space where you just aren't exactly sure, that's not weakness. Asking for help isn't weakness, it's maturity. It's a sign of wisdom. Again, the author of Proverbs puts it this way. Listen, he says, listen to counsel. Listen to counsel. Now don't raise your hand or elbow anybody, but some of us guys, it is so hard to take counsel from other people. It's an ego thing, it's a pride thing. I am as guilty as anybody else. I just have to just exhale, don't bow up, don't power up, don't say, well, let me tell you what I know. Just, just shut up, Andy, and just listen. Listen to counsel and accept discipline. You know what this means? It means accept the fact that you're wrong. If you, do, if you don't accept the fact that you're wrong, you will continue to be what? Wrong, right, does any, I mean, you know, your, my goal in life is to never learn anything new and to only, no, no, we, nobody wants to end up there. So he says, listen to counsel, accept discipline, that you may be wise and listen to this, you know, proverbial promise. You'll be wise the rest of your days. Here's what that means. You'll be wise in this season and prepare in such a way that you're ready for the next season. You'll be wise for the rest of your days because if the pattern, this is a pattern and a habit, if the pattern and the habit of your life is to be open to the counsel and the wisdom of others, even people who aren't as smart as you, even people who aren't as accomplished as you, even people who aren't as, su as successful as you, and even people who aren't as educated as you, I just covered all the reasons that many of us are like, I can't listen to her, I can't listen to her. What have they ever accomplished? Well, wait, 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 what? He says, just listen to counsel and you'll be wise for the rest of your day. So choose a destination in this leg of the journey or in this season and borrow a map and perhaps you'll get where you're going with, well, you get there faster and with less regret. Rule number four, gotta keep going. Rule number four, pay attention to the signs. <clears throat> pay attention to the signs. Okay, road signs are there for our protection as well as our direction. Um, many of us, some of us, some of you think that those signs are for other people, right? Yeah, those are for what other people need to do. I don't need to slow down the curve. I'm a good driver, you know. Yellow light, that means speed up, right? So I can get through the, get the intersection. Um, you know, we just, we just, and then when we see other drivers ignore those signs, what do we think? Idiot, putting other people's lives at risk. <clears throat> Sometimes it's hard to see the idiot in the mirror, right? And the same is true 
in life for all of us, right? Again, the, the, the author of Proverbs. And this is a verse I've encouraged you to memorize. I hope you've memorized it. If not, you gotta memorize this verse. Maybe I just feel compelled to say that because of the, the role it's played in my life. The prudent, the wise, the people who know the life's connected, the prudent see the signs and they respond. The prudent see danger and they take refuge. The prudent see the signs and they respond to the signs. Wise people pay attention to the signs, the signs of what's going on with their friends and paying attention to what I see going on with my kids and I'm paying attention to some stuff I see going on with my marriage. And you know what, I'm paying attention to what I see going on financially. We're not in trouble yet, but you know what? The, I, I need to slow down in that curve. You know, I, I see what's going on professionally. I'm not gonna just live in la-la land and pretend everything's fine. I'm gonna pay attention to the signs. It's always tempting to ignore signs. It is most tempting to ignore signs relationally. But relationships are like a combustible engine. Nothing improves with neglect. But one of the reasons we ignore the signs in our relationships, honestly, is we don't know what to do. You know, I can fix my router. You know, I can fix, I can fix a lot of things electronically. I can, you know, I, I, I like to fix things. When it comes to relationships, it's like, I don't know what to do. So I'm just gonna go reboot my, my you know, internet because I know how to do that. But relationally, I don't know. So we just, we are tempted to ignore the signs, but nothing improves with neglect, especially relationships. So, <clears throat> Again, you may hate me for this, but if, if more than one person, if more than one person has brought something to your attention that you need to think about or work on, that's a sign. If more than one person, and they don't even know each other, it's like they've been talking. No, you're the common denominator. It's obvious, it's not obvious to you, but it's obvious to everybody. If more than one person has brought to your attention something that you need to pay attention to, that's a sign. The only time um, I ever was arrested, <clears throat> Pause and let you digest that. It was a long time ago. <clears throat> <clears throat> Only time I was ever arrested is not that I ignored a sign, I actually moved a sign. Because it was in my way. I was 16 years old, I'm like, that's in my way. So I got out of my car and moved a sign. And then uh, I, I got where I was going late, really, really late, and had an interesting conversation with my dad. So the point, the point is, have you ever moved a sign? Let me tell you what move a sign looks like, sounds like in the real world. Do you ever heard yourself say this? Okay, don't ever bring that up again. I, I, I just wanna take that sign off my road. Don't ever, I, I, don't, honey, son, mom, whoever, don't ever, or I don't wanna hear that anymore. I don't wanna hear about that anymore, or I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Quit putting, quit, quit showing me signs, I'm fine. What do you respond to in that way? You're ignoring the signs. You keep ignoring those signs, you're taking the long way, taking the wrong way. You may never arrive because the prudence see danger and take refuge, but the simple, I'm fine, I know everything I need to know, you're wrong. The simple, the people, to, they don't understand life is connected, that today leads to tomorrow and today is gonna show up tomorrow. The simple keep going and they pay the penalty. But you won't be the only one who pays because everybody is looking to you, responsible, that you're responsible for, that depends on you. They're gonna pay as well. So pay attention, pay attention to the signs. Last, but not least, the fifth and final one. This is kind of the heaviest one, but I think it's maybe the most important in terms of getting to where we wanna get in life and ultimately getting to where your heavenly father wants you to get in life. The fifth and final one is this, don't carry unnecessary baggage. If you carry too much baggage on a trip, it just slows you down, right? You know, just weighs you down. Um, years ago, Sandra and I were traveling with these dear friends of ours, Howard and Doris, and um, we've traveled, you know, most of our trips outside the country, we've gone with Howard and Doris. They're just our travel buddies and they love to travel, love the same kind of stuff. And so we were standing at, the, at Hartsfield at the, behind the counter and we were put, putting our luggage up on the scale thing, you know? And so Sandra had her back to the counter and she's talking to Doris and Howard and I are putting the luggage up there. So I put Sandra's suitcase up and it went over, you know, the, the limit. <clears throat> And Howard sees it and he taps Sandra on the shoulder and he says, 
Sandra, you have a weight problem. <laughs> and the look in her eye was, this is gonna be an awkward trip. <laughs> and we have laughed about that for about five years. Sandra, honey, you have a weight problem. Anyway, so um, there's always a temptation to overpack on a road trip, right? And on a road trip, it's not a big deal, but on a life trip, it may be the biggest deal. Unnecessary baggage, unnecessary baggage, what happens? Unnecessary baggage, you know, it's, it's, it, on a life trip, it's, it's a really big deal. Unnecessary baggage will slow you down and it'll slow everyone down in your family and everyone around you who's trying to do life with you. Uh, un, uh, baggage is that, un, you know, this is that unresolved or partially resolved stuff from the past. It, the, our baggage is the stuff from the past that keeps showing up in the future and keeps showing up in the present. And it seems to just make things more and more and more complicated. It actually empowers the past to define our future. It empowers the past to detour us from our destination of choice. So are you carrying any unnecessary baggage? You should take a look. And the reason we should all take a look every once in a while is because we've all been hurt and we've all been betrayed and we've all been left out and we've all been neglected. Some of us, you were forced to parent a parent because your parent was just so incapable even when you were in high school or college student or maybe you had to forego a career to move back home to parent a parent. And there's just stuff, right? Left you angry, left you vulnerable, left you suspicious of other relationships. And it's hard to unpack that stuff. It's hard not just to carry along with us. And the reason it's hard to not to, to leave it behind is because it's part of our story. It's part of our life experience. So there's just something in us that's like, no, I just have to carry this with me the rest of my life because it was such an integral part of my life. But it's best to unpack and leave it behind. And the reason you know it's best to unpack and leave it behind is because you want the people you're doing life with to unpack theirs and leave theirs behind when it begins to complicate your life, but it's hard to imagine that. But if you don't, and if I don't, if you don't, if you don't deal with your demons, they go into the cellar of your soul and they just lift weights and they get bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. And the thing that's so deceiving about this is the event itself gets further and further and further and further behind as you move forward but the consequences and the shrapnel gets bigger and bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. And as time goes by, most people lose sight of, most people lose sight of the source of their anger, the source of their bitterness, the source of their angst, the source of their, oh, you know, they're just too complicated and they're too sensitive. They lose sight of the source. When in fact, the source is something that happened as part of their story. This is probably what Paul had in mind when he said to Christians, he said, look, you, you can't help but get angry sometimes. Sometimes you're just gonna get angry. But if you're a Jesus follower, be angry, but don't sin. Figure out how to separate yourself in a healthy way from what caused you or made you angry and the behavior that just complicates your life. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil space or to contextualize it for our conversation. <clears throat> Don't give the devil space in your luggage. Don't give the devil a toehold, a handle, a, a something that creates a, a place where he can hang on, a hiding place. And if you're not comfortable with the devil, we can change the word. Don't give bitterness and don't give resentment and don't give fear and don't give anger, a toehold, a place in your luggage where you carry it around over and over and over. Got any demons down there lifting weights? Carrying any unnecessary baggage? If you're not sure, <laughs> um, the people closest to you, they know, they know. And they know because they have to help you carry it. They have to help you, they, you know, they have to help you carry it. By that, I mean, sometimes they have to duck your anger. They have to navigate your overreaction they have to navigate your moods. They have to avoid certain topics because every time those topics come up, you just escalate so they just, shh, no, we don't talk about that. And the fact that they don't talk about it, you think you're fine, but it's because they're having to help you carry your baggage. They, they work hard to ignore or try to ignore your substance abuse. And they, the people who love you the most, 
would love for you to unpack that stuff or to find someone to help you unpack that stuff or to use the apostle Paul's words. He's just direct. He says, just get rid of it. Leave it behind. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger along with every form of malice. And then he tells us how, and it's so simple that it seems simplistic. He says, it's, I know you're gonna, you know, it just seems too simple. It seems too good to be true. He says, here's how you do it, by forgiving each other. This is how you get rid of bitterness and anger. You find out the source and you unpack and you forgive and you say, Andy, but you don't know my story. And you're right, I don't know your story. And I would never say this except for what Paul says next. He says, you are to forgive just as in Christ, God forgave you that we don't forgive because people deserve to be forgiven. They may not, but then neither did we. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We we cancel other people's debts because God through Christ canceled our debt. And here's here's the trick to all this. See, when you're hurt and when I'm hurt, it creates a debt-debtor relationship. The hurt, the betrayal, the abandonment, whatever it might be, it creates debt. They owe me a childhood. They owe me a first marriage back. They owe me the opportunity to put my kids in bed at night. They owe me an education. They owe me, they owe me, they owe me, they owe me, they owe me. And what happens is that their debt becomes your baggage. (laughs) And I've been there. We lug it around waiting to be paid back. (laughs) And while we're lugging it around waiting to be paid back, the demons are lifting weights, lifting weights, lifting weights, lifting weights, get stronger and stronger and stronger. And the problem is, of course, the people from our past, they can't pay us back. Half the time, they don't even know they, 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 they owe us anything. And the other reason they can't pay us back is because we come equipped with rear view mirrors, but no reverse. They can't give you your childhood back or a marriage back or an opportunity back or career back. They can't give it back to you. So get rid of all bitterness. <clears throat> Rage and anger, along with every form of malice, close those accounts. Tell your demons, I'm closing the gym and they'll complain. But over time, their voices, not immediately, but over time, their voices will grow weaker and weaker and weaker. And it's not fair to forgive. It's not fair because they actually owe you. But it's not about fairness. This is about your freedom. So cancel those debts. Unpack all that stuff. Choose to forgive. Cancel their debt. You just decide. This is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is I've decided you don't owe me anymore. And who knows? Unpack all that stuff. You might be able to get by with a carry on. So those are the five rules for the road. In review, they're going to be on your cup as you leave today. Don't travel alone. Don't pick up strangers. Choose a destination and borrow a map. Pay attention to the signs and don't carry unnecessary baggage. You're gonna end up somewhere in life. End up there on purpose. If you're not a Christian or a Jesus follower, all these things apply to you. But if you're a Jesus follower, he has a plan for you and he has good things for you. And this is how we get our lives in sync with him. Follow these rules and you'll reach your destination on time and on purpose. I'd love to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for all this wisdom literature that you preserve for a long, long time. A couple of thousand, no, like 3,500 years we've had this laying around, sitting on our coffee tables. And Father, wherever this landed with each of us, um, would you please give us the wisdom to know what to do with it? And mainly, would you give us the courage to do it? And Father, for the men here, we're, so, we're just so bad at listening to other people and we feel like we gotta tell our stories rather than listen to somebody else's and just give us the courage to set our ego aside and just listen and learn and become wise. Father, for the men and women, the students in the transitions, I pray they wouldn't just be, just gravitate toward acceptance, but they would surround themselves with people worth doing the journey with. So again, wherever this lands, Father, for those of us who, gosh, we've been carrying around the same baggage for so long, just, Give us the courage to turn around and face it, get help, leave it behind once and for all. So wherever this lands, give us the courage to respond appropriately in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up, we're gonna sing a little bit. Here we go. Come to the end of yourself Do you thought
Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you again for joining us today. Now we cannot wait to see you on June 6th. To stay up to date with all the information that you need to know, make sure you head to buckheadchurch.org slash emails to get on our email list. Now we will be taking off next week as a church because it is Memorial Day weekend. So we hope that you have a lot of fun doing whatever you're doing and enjoy your weekend. And we will see you back on June 6th. Thank you.